Welcome back. In this third module, we continue our theme of obligations, but this time we're looking at obligations that we have voluntarily agreed to. And we call those agreed to obligations contracts. And so we're going to be looking at these aspects of contracts. Now, what is a contract? A contract is a legally enforceable promise. It's a legally enforceable means that if a person violates the terms of a contract, if they fail to perform as they promise to do in the contract, then the wronged party, the party that did not breach the contract, has a right to bring a claim in court to have the court order you to either comply with the contract or to pay damages that were caused by your failure to perform. Now, contracts are vital for protecting expectations and enabling planning and other sorts of transactions. Businesses enter into contracts for, to ensure stability that in the future. So you, if you are running an airline, you will probably be, be contracting for aviation fuel a year into the future. Now the price of fuel may be lower than what you anticipate in the contract, but at the same time, it could be higher. So you lock in one value with the idea that I am going to use that as a form of planning. Contracts really form the basis for modern society. We enter into contracts every day. We are, have very complicated contracts. We have cell phone contracts. We have Xbox contracts. When we go to the store, we enter into a sales contract. Contracts are really at the heart of American society in the 21st century. So today we're going to look at the nature of a contract and the requirements for agreement and consideration. Two elements of a contract. So why are contracts important? Well, they're so important that even the Constitution of the United States protects the right to contract. Article 1, Section 10 limits the ability of the government to interfere with contracts. Furthermore, much of American history has been based on the legal doctrine of freedom of contract, that two individuals should be able to contract to whatever they wish to contract. And so this is the underlying basis for how business operates. There are exceptions to freedom of contract, but they are exceptions to the rule that is freedom of contract the right of the people involved in business to enter into contracts. Now, where does contract law come from? Well, first of all, the common law. The common law, law that comes from cases, controls certain types of contracts, primarily contracts for services, meaning if you go to an accountant or you go to a lawyer, or you pay a tennis instructor to teach you tennis. All of those contracts are subject to the common law and the common law set of rules. Similarly, real estate, real property, is also subject to the common law. So if you are selling a house, then you are subject to the common law contracting system real property. Real property is generally anything it, anything that is the land or that is attached to permanently to the land, like a house or a building. Now, another source of contract law is what's known as the Uniform Commercial Code. Now, the Uniform Commercial Code is not a law per se. It's more of a model law that was promulgated and virtually every state has adopted the UCC in whole or in part. So the Uniform Commercial Code generally governs the sale of goods, meaning those tangible, movable objects. When we sell those, we are not subject to the common law contracting system. We're subject to the UCC contracting system. 
And finally, there's the Convention on the International Sale of Goods, also known as the CISG, and it covers the international sale of goods between merchants, people who are in the business of buying and selling goods. Let's talk about the elements of a valid contract. We're going to go over these. We're going to talk about the four basic required elements, and then we'll spend some time discussing each one in more detail. And in this lecture, we're going to cover the first and second. The first is mutual assent. Mutual assent is an agreement. It's an agreement that is made up of two parts called an offer and an acceptance. And we'll explain what those are and how do we know if they are there or not. The second element is consideration. Consideration is the benefit that each party receives from a contract. If you agree to sell me your car for $5,000, the benefit I'm going to get from that exchange is the car. The benefit you're going to get is the $500. So that $500 represents consideration. It's the thing that seals the deal. The third element is legality. The contract must not violate the law. So you cannot enter into a contract to, um, with, a, uh, with someone to burn a house down. That's against the law. So the contract is not going to be valid. And finally, capacity. The parties have to be legally capable of entering into a contract. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Now, contracts can be described in several different ways. And these are terms that which all sound kind of the same. And so there is some room for confusion. Make sure for your test that you understand how these terms are different, starting with a valid contract. Valid contract is a contract that has all of the required elements. Offer, acceptance, consideration, legality, and capacity. So a contract that is valid is enforceable. We can go to court and have the state enforce that agreement. The second type of contract is a void contract. An avoid contract is an agreement which lacks a required element of a valid contract, meaning perhaps there was no assent or there was no consideration, or was not formed in accordance with the law. So a contract to burn down a house is illegal and therefore void. It's a void contract. Now the third type is the one that causes some confusion, and that's voidable. Now, if a contract is voidable, one or more parties to the contract have the right to either cancel the contract or to enforce the contract. For instance, we're going to talk about capacity and we're going to talk about a person who makes a contract when they are a minor lacks capacity. However, the minor has the ability to enforce that contract or void it. That's why we call it voidable. It's the party who has the right to control it who has the right to void it. So in this case, the minor would have the right to avoid the contract or to require the other person to go through with it. So a minor, for instance, who buys a gym membership cannot be held liable for payment of the membership fees because they were a minor. However, that minor can insist on going to the gym as long as they continue to pay their fees. So that's a voidable contract. One party will have the right to cancel the contract. And finally, an unenforceable contract is a valid contract, otherwise valid contract, that cannot be enforced by the court because of a legal defense. The classic case for this is the situation of where statute of limitations is involved. The law gives to you a, a time period in which to bring a claim for breach of contract, generally three or four years. Now, if you bring that claim more than four years after the breach of the contract, 
you cannot enforce that claim. It is a valid contract, but you cannot enforce it because of some legal impediment, something like the statute of limitations. Let's talk about mutual assent, that first element of a contract, the first required element. Mutual assent is the agreement of the parties. So when we're talking about mutual assent, that's just a legal term reflecting agreement. Sometimes we refer to this mutual assent as a meeting of the minds. The parties agreed as to the terms and conditions of the contract. Meeting of the minds, I really don't like that phraseology, but you see it so often in the law and so many people talk about it, I feel like I should let you know what it means. It refers to that agreement of the parties. And the parties reach mutual assent using a combination of an offer and an acceptance. Now, the offeror will make an offer to the offeree that's, and the, then the offeree must in turn accept the offer in order to create a binding contract. So the offeror and the offeree, those are positions that can change. If I offer to sell you my computer for $500, I am the offeror, you are the offeree. If you say, no, I will not pay $500, but I will pay $300, well, you have rejected my offer, and now you have become the offeror, and I am the offeree. So now I have the ability to accept your offer, enter into a contract, or reject your offer, which puts us back in our pre-offer positions. So mutual assent is made up of offer and acceptance, those two items. Let's start by talking about an offer. An offer is a promise or commitment to do or to refrain from doing a specified activity. Something like, I will sell you my computer for $500. What do we need for a valid offer? Well, we need what's called objective intent, meaning would a person looking at this particular language, would they believe that an offer has been made? Would they believe that there is a valid offer there? So we look for objective intent, not just what's in the mind of the party, of the offeror, but what is would a reasonable person say if they saw that agreement? We also look for clear and definite terms. The offer should be so definite that if the contract is later breached, we can calculate damages based on the terms of the offer. So we want clear and reasonably definite terms. The offer must be communicated to the offeree. So we not only have to make the offer, then you have to communicate that offer to the offeree. When studying objective intent, one of the most famous cases that you will see, and again, if you go to law school, you'll probably see this case, and it's called Lucy versus Zemer. Lucy versus Zemer is a case from the 1950s, and in that case, two individuals are involved, Mr. Lucy and Mr. Zemer. So Mr. Lucy offers to buy Zemer's farm for $20,000, but Zemer rejected the offer. Later, years later, the two neighbors are out drinking, enjoying an evening at a restaurant, and this time Lucy offered to buy the farm again for $50,000. Zemer wrote on the back of a pad, we hereby agree to sell to Mr. Lucy the Ferguson farm for $50,000. Both Zemer and his wife signed the writing, and before signing, the parties actually modified the writing several times, and then Lou, Mr. Lucy signed the writing as well. Now, the next day, Zemer denied there was a valid contract, claiming it was all a joke. It was all a friendly joke, banter, exchange between neighbors, and that he never intended to sell the farm. Mr. Lucy brings Mr. Zemer to court, 
asking the court to force him to sell the farm. The court ruled in favor of Lucy, holding that although Zemer subjectively did not intend to be bound by the contract, objectively, a reasonable person would have construed Zemer's actions and words as an intent to contract. And so this is why objective intent is important in deciding whether there has been a valid offer or not. What about advertisements? You see an ad on the web offering to sell you a good, offering to sell you a t-shirt for five dollars. That seems like a really good buy. You quickly press the buy it now button, at which point the company emails you back to say this was a mistake on our part that in fact the t-shirt sells for fifty dollars. Can you hold them to that agreement? Was that a valid offer to sell you the shirt for five dollars? Well generally advertisements are not offers. The law construes advertisements as an invitation to make an offer. There are a few exceptions to this, but ordinarily, if you see an advertisement and the problem, then it's not an offer. So keep that in mind for your exam. So we have an offer made. We have a valid offer being made. Now, how can the offer terminate? Well, an offer can terminate in several different ways. First of all, an offer can terminate because of the actions of the parties starting with revocation. The offeror generally has the right to revoke their offer at any time before acceptance. Rejection. The offeree can reject the offer, and if the offeree rejects the offer, then the offer terminates. Again, the offer is dead at that point. If I offer to sell you my computer for $500 and you say no, that offer is gone. You cannot come back the next day and say, I will pay $500 for your computer. That then will become a new offer. Similarly, a counter offer. A counter offer is a rejection plus a new offer. I offer to sell you my computer for $500. You reply, I will pay $300 for your computer. At that point, my offer is terminated. Your counter offer has terminated my offer. If I say no, and you say, okay, I will pay $500, that is in fact another offer. Your counter offer terminated the offer. So be sure and look at these types of problems on your test. And if you see a revocation or rejection or counter offer, then the offer is terminated. Let's talk about each of those in a little more detail. Starting at Revocation. Now, the rule is an offer can be revoked at any time before acceptance. Generally, any time before acceptance, unless certain events occur. Now, express communication is required by the offeror to revoke or to withdraw the offer or to enter into some inconsistent act that would give reasonable notice to the offeree that the offer no longer exists. For instance, if you offer to sell a computer for $500 to one person, and then while you're waiting, you wind up selling that computer to another person. If the original offeree hears of your second agreement, then that he would know that the offer has been revoked. An offer can be irrevocable, if there is an option to enter into a contract. If, for instance, I offer to sell you my computer for $500 and you say, I need time to think about it, I can say, I will hold the offer open for 24 hours. That's what we call a firm offer. Now, ordinarily, for common law contracts, there must be some sort of consideration paid for holding the offer open. 
if I make a job offer to you, I offer to employ you at $50,000 a year, and you say, I need time to think about it, and I, as the employer, say, okay, I will give you a week to answer me. That attempt to make the offer irrevocable doesn't do so. If three days later, I, the employer, notify you that I am revoking the offer, the offer is revoked. The only way to hold that offer open is if you had paid me consideration. If you said, I need more time to think about it, and I said, I will hold the offer open for 24 hours if you pay me $500. So there must be some consideration involved to make the offer irrevocable. Now, rejection of an offer terminates the offer. An offer is terminated when the offeree rejects it, when there is some sort of rejection. Now, the mirror image rule, which is a rule in the common law, states that if there is a purported acceptance, if the offeree accepts, but they, in doing so, they have altered the terms of the original offer, then that constitutes a rejection. If I say I will sell you my motorcycle for $2,000 and you say yes, as long as you throw in a motorcycle helmet. Now, according to the common law, there is no contract formed because there is a divergence between the terms of the offer and the terms of the acceptance. So any modification to the offer will turn that purported acceptance into a rejection plus a new offer. And then finally, counteroffer. A counteroffer, again, is a rejection plus a new offer. A counteroffer terminates the original offer and makes a new offer, even if there's only a slight change in terms from the original offer. So on your test, be very careful about this situation involving a counteroffer. If on March 2nd, I offer to sell you my computer for $500, and on March 3rd, you say, I will not pay $500, but I will pay $450, and I say, no, you cannot then bind me to the original $500 offer. A counteroffer terminates the original offer. So that offer is gone by, term, by means of a rejection. Now, an offer can terminate by the actions of the parties, we just discussed, and it can also terminate by operation of the law. Sometimes events may happen that may terminate the offer even without any actions on part of the offeror or the offeree. First of all, lapse of time. How much time? A reasonable time. If I make an offer to sell you my computer today for $500, and you contact me five years from now and say, I will accept your offer, that offer has terminated because of a lapse of time. We can't say for sure how long the time is, but we do know it has to be a reasonable. If either the offeror or the offeree dies or becomes incapacitated, then again, the offer terminates even without actions of the parties. Destruction of the contract subject matter before acceptance will terminate the offer. If I offer to sell you my car for $5,000 and you say, I'll think about it, and that night lightning strikes and destroys the car, the offer has been terminated. Finally, supervening illegality. If when we enter into a contract, the contract involves legal subject matter, but Prior, or when I make the offer, it's for legal subject matter. But prior to your acceptance, that becomes illegal. Then the offer lapses. So that's all you need to know about offer. What is an offer? How does an offer work? How is an offer terminated? Let's turn to the second half of mutual assent, which is Acceptance. Now, acceptance is a voluntary act that shows agreement to the terms of an offer. In essence, an acceptance is an offeree's agreement 
to the terms of the offer. Now, the offeror has the power to terminate the offer or modify its terms or prescribe the method of acceptance up until the offer is accepted by the offeree. Once the offeree accepts the offer, then that becomes mutual assent. That is mutual agreement. The offeror loses the right to revoke that offer. Now, an acceptance can be expressed. It can be, yes, I accept the terms of your agreement. But acceptance can also be implied. For instance, if I'm buying goods from a dealer and the dealer simply ships me the goods without actually saying, yes, I agree to this contract, that too constitutes acceptance. It's a voluntary act that shows you agree to the terms of the offer. Now we need to touch on the mailbox rule. The mailbox rule is a legal doctrine. It's a common law legal doctrine. And what it says is that an acceptance is valid once it is sent. Once the offeree sends the acceptance, even though the offeror may not have received the acceptance, the offer is accepted. When the document, when the agreement is placed in the mailbox, why we call it the mailbox rule. Of course, it doesn't have to be an actual mailbox. It could be an email. It could be a text message. Uh, it could be a, a, an actual uh, FedEx package. In any event, it is acceptance becomes valid on dispatch. So on your test, if there's a question about when is the contract formed, the contract will be formed once the offeree has sent notice of the acceptance. So once the, the acceptance is dispatched, once it's sent, this deprives the offeror the right to revoke the offer. And again, an acceptance is effective on dispatch. However, revocation is not effective until receipt. So revocation doesn't take place on dispatch when it is sent, but instead is based on when it is received. Acceptance, however, is effective on dispatch. So that's mutual assent. That's the first element of a valid contract. Now we turn to consideration. Consideration is something of legally sufficient value given in return for a promise. It is the mutual exchange of benefits and detriments. It is the thing of value that is being exchanged by the parties. And in a contract, there must be a bargained for exchange. That's what you're looking for with a contract. Some mutual exchange of benefits and detriments. Now, forbearance, which means to give up a legal right, can be consideration as well. So if you are 21 years old and your favorite uncle comes to you and says, I will pay you $25,000 if you don't take a drink before you turn 25. If you don't drink any alcohol before you turn 25. Now, you as a 21-year-old have a legal right to drink alcohol. If you give up that legal right, then that constitutes consideration. And that means that at the age of 25, you can now turn to your favorite uncle and say, pay me the money. Pay me what you owe me. So consideration really consists of this legal detriment. Doing or promising to do something that you are not legally obligated to do. Now you should be aware that consideration exchange doesn't have to be of equal value. Courts will not assess whether the agreement was fair, the fairness of the exchange. Was enough money paid uh, for the item, the subject matter of the contract? Courts generally don't assess the fairness of it. 
All they want to see is that something of value was exchanged, and it can be minimal. For instance, in every real estate contract that you see, in every deed from a seller to a buyer, there's always the language for $10 and other consideration. The $10 is never actually paid. It simply sets out there is consideration for this transaction. So consideration consists of a legal detriment. It's something of value, but it doesn't necessarily have to match the value of the subject matter of the contract. Now, there are certain agreements that lack consideration, starting with what's called the pre-existing duty rule. If a party does or promises to do something that they are already legally obligated to do, then the law does not recognize that as a sufficient legal detriment. So if you are a police officer and you arrest a kidnapper and there is a reward for this kidnapper, you as the police officer cannot collect the reward in large part because you already had a pre-existing duty to catch the kidnapper. Thus, the contract is unenforceable. So if you promise to do something that you are already legally obligated to do, then it doesn't constitute consideration. Illusory promises is another form of lack of consideration. And these are promises that no one really expects to be upheld. So a deathbed promise made to comfort the dying, promises of a gift, promises of love and friendship, promises that by their terms are not binding, meaning I will sell you my computer for $500 if I don't sell it to someone else. That's an illusory promise. It's not a real promise. So those types of promises will not constitute consideration. Past consideration is a promise made in return for a detriment that has been previously made by the promise. So a promise made in return for detriment that has already taken place is not sufficient to create a valid contract. Say you have a friend who is a realtor who offers to sell your house and not take a commission on that sale. Sale goes through, it's a lot of money. You decide that, hey, you want to give your realtor some money. If you promise to pay a commission, that promise is unenforceable. It's not sufficient to create a valid contract because this has already been paid, past consideration. The last type of contract that we're going to cover is not really a contract. It's what we call a quasi-contract. And it's the concept of promissory estoppel. Now, under the doctrine of promissory estoppel, a party can recover damages, a party that has relied on a promise, if the promisor made a promise that was reasonable and the promise the promisor actually relied on the promise and then suffered an injury, and that reliance was reasonably foreseeable to the promisor, then you may be able to recover. Now, you're not going to recover contract damages, but instead what you recover are called reliance damages. So if, for instance, someone offers you a job and they say, I will hire you, to come work for me at a salary of $50,000 a year. And you say, that's great, but I need to give notice to my current employer. And so you give your employer two weeks notice. Meanwhile, the original company, the promisor, the one who promised you a job, decides that they can't wait two weeks and they make an offer to 
the second place person, and the second place person takes the job. Now, you cannot sue the employer for breach of contract. The reason why is because you are an employment at, employee at will, and the employer had the right to fire you at any time. Even if you had showed up, they could have fired you the next five minutes. So you don't have a right to sue the employer for that. But say you quit your job. You packed up your stuff. You moved across the country. You incurred damages based on my promise to employ you. You might be able to recover those reliance damages. What was the amount that you spent in reliance on my promise? So promissory estoppel is not a contract. It's more of a quasi-contract. So in conclusion, what did we learn here? Contracts are important to businesses. A valid contract requires offer, acceptance, and consideration. And finally, justifiable reliance on a promise may provide a path for reliance damages. That's all for this lecture. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.